everyone. Today I have with me author Richie Unterberger. And Richie's newest book is about Fleetwood Mac. He has written tons of books, but this is his most current one. And I am so happy to be able to talk to you today, Richie. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I have been – okay, I'm 52. So when I saw that you had written a book about Fleetwood Mac, I I knew I had to read it because this is my – you know, this is my era. This is my, this is my, this is what I remember. And of course, when uh, rumors came out, I was young. Um, it was like 1976. And, but what I do remember is I had very young parents and my dad had gone out to buy the album and I remember it. Like I remember when he brought it home and I remember listening to it and, and it was so different and it was so amazing. And, you know, so everybody in, in my age group that remembers, you know, them coming, you know, basically they're, they're starting up. It's like, you know, we, we just love Fleetwood Mac. I mean, we can't get enough of Fleetwood Mac. So I'm so happy that you wrote a book about them. Thanks. And, um, but I did read um, Mick Fleetwood's autobiography back in early 90s, I guess it was. Yes. I think it was in the early 90s. But uh, your book goes into so much more depth. And, and you've written books about, you know, The Who and The Beatles. And, and I wondered, like, what what did you want? Why did you want to write a book about them? Fleetwood Mac has a very interesting history, and especially in the United States. A lot of what they did before they became very famous in the mid-1970s isn't widely known. And their career was really unpredictable. The version of Fleetwood Mac that's most famous by far here, of course, is the one that did Rumors with Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. And the album they did before that, and then also Tusk after that, those three albums from the last half of the 1970 are really viewed as the core of their legacy in the United States. But they started as a band that was so different that really the only thing they had in common with the Rumors Fleetwood Mac was their name. That's Mm -hmm. not an exaggeration. When they started in the late 1960s, they were a blues band. And there's a little bit of blues influence in the 1970s Fleetwood Mac, maybe most strongly in some of Christine McVie's vocals, but there's not much. They changed enormously, and also, even in between the time when they started in 1967 and when they really had their first huge hit in the mid-'70s, they changed lineups like half a dozen times or more. And besides their musical changes, what's interesting is there are so many times when they could have just given up and broken up, because not only did key members of the band leave, but they left very unexpectedly and under very strange circumstances, which would have dispirited most groups from continuing. Maybe 95 or more times out of 100, such groups would have broken up, or a couple of the guys would have just joined different groups and said, we're not trying to keep this going. I think that even though Mick Fleetwood has hardly written any of their material, and sung none of it. I mean, he speaks one song from the 90s, but that doesn't really count. (laughs) Um, He is actually, he deserves the title of leader. You wouldn't say that of almost any other major group. You know, a guy or a woman is the leader who doesn't write the songs and doesn't sing because he's the guy who was committed to keeping this going. It was so important to him to have the group. And if he wasn't there, if it was just some rather average good drummer who wasn't thinking of the big picture of keeping a band together with a lot of different complementary talents, they would have broken up years before they became famous. So that was, as a writer, the most interesting aspect of the group for me to tie together. And I can talk about their different styles and lineups if you want. Well, what was interesting to me when I read his autobiography, like I said, back in the early 90s, is that I didn't, you know, that's a, that's the part we didn't know about. You know, we only knew who they were in the 70s. 
you know, in the middle 70s. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, why did I not know this? It, it was so shocking, you know. But I love the way that you told their story. Um, it was really in-depth, and it really, you know, made a lot of sense to me. And, you know, this is, like I said, it's my era of – area of music that I love to begin with, but I love hearing about how you went into um, the, what was happening in London at the time in the late 60s, early 70s. And yeah, if you, you know, you could, you can give them a brief, you know, everybody a brief and, and for everybody who can't, you know, that, that it doesn't get this book, please go get the book. Do not get the Kindle. This book is beautiful. You are going to love this hardback. So anyway, but yeah, you know, tell everybody about what you know how it all started. Fleetwood Mac were an outgrowth of the British blues rock scene. The most famous band from that scene was the Rolling Stones, of course. And I'm mm. talking about British groups like us mm-hmm. there, who loved blues and blues offshoot like early rock and roll, like Chuck Berry and soul music. And wanted to play it so badly that even though there were very, um, you know, that music was not being played in England where there were not African Americans, obviously, they loved it so much that they decided to play it. And even though they were trying to replicate it, because they're British and they have different influences growing up, it came out somewhat differently. The guys in Fleet, well, the three guys uh, who founded Fleet with Mac, basically, came from John Mayall's Blues Breakers, who didn't have hit records, but they had great guitarists, Eric Clapton before Cream, and then the founder of Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green. He was actually replaced by Mick Taylor, who went on to the Rolling Stones. So amazing mm-hmm. musicians passed through the Blues Breakers. And John McVie had been a bass player for John Mayall for almost five years. Mick Fleetwood was briefly in... Fleetwood Mac playing with those guys in 1967. And Peter Green, a great guitarist, he did just one album with John Mayall, which was very good, but he had so much talent, not as a, just as a guitarist, but also as a singer and songwriter, that he couldn't remain a sideman, and he wanted to do his own thing. And because he played well with Fleetwood and McVie, who of course are still in Fleetwood Mac, but also, I think, just as importantly, got along with them really well as friends. He wanted to form the band with them. And they brought in another guy who was new, Jeremy Spencer, a really young blues guitarist. And that's where they started. And they were really good. They were much more popular in England than in the United States. They had hit albums and then even some hit singles in the late uh, 60s in England. And they started as a blues group, but then they got into something different That's more that was more wide-ranging. It had a blues feel, but um, they brought in classical and personal singing, songwriting, um, meditative instrumentals. So things looked enormously promising for them, and they did tour the United States, even though um, they were what would be called then an underground band here. They got played on FM radio sometimes. Um, People were starting to hear about them, but they weren't selling a lot of records. They weren't famous. This is the first really unexpected thing that happens. Peter Green leaves, not like, oh, to go solo, like Eric Clapton left uh, Cream and eventually Mm -hmm. went solo after a couple of years, but because he was so disillusioned with the music business, and he was only like 23, 24, that he just wanted to get out of the music business. Um, He felt uncomfortable earning all this money, Um, He wanted to get into a more spiritual life. He actually proposed to the other guys in the group. They were all guys at that point. Um, We should just play for charity, just do our money, um, you know, give away our money. And those guys who were really good friends with him, they were kind of freaked out. It's like, you know, we're losing our leader, not just musically, but also he's starting to get really strange mentally. Anyway, he left in spring 1970, a lot of groups would have broken up then because he had written and sung their best songs, even though um, some other guys in the band did some writing. I think the first key thing that they did, which a lot of groups would not have done in their situation besides stay together, is that 
there's a lot of sexism in rock music and society, and there was a lot more so back then. But Mick Fleetwood had the um, humility and wisdom to realize, well, a solution to getting more songwriting talent in this group is right in front of us. John McVie had recently married Christine McVie, who had been in a British group called Chicken Shack, a blues band. She did by far their best stuff, if you hear their records. Mm -hmm. And she was just kind of helping them out. She had left the music business to be a housewife, but she was hanging around, living with the bands, and filling in with piano and backup vocals. And it was obvious, why don't we get Christine in the group? She's going to be the best songwriter. Um, and in the albums they made between 1970 and 1975, um, I think that she is the strongest songwriter, although they also got an American guy in, Bob Welch, for a few years, who wrote some good stuff. Um, a couple other unpredictable things happened, though, along the way. So Jeremy Spencer was one of the main guys after Peter Green left, and they were on tour in the U.S. in early the 1970s, and he left the group very unexpectedly to join what most people would consider a religious cult, Children of God. I mean, he was in Los Angeles, and he didn't come back to the hotel, and it took him hmm. two days to find him, and he was in the cult. I mean, that was how weird and unexpected wow. it was. Um, and a couple years after that, Danny Kerwin, who had joined as a fifth member in 1968, a very good guitarist, also did some songwritings. He was just getting harder to get along with, and he left the band. Unfortunately, he's been, he had his own mental illness problems uh, shortly after that. And one of the guys that got, they got in when they were making these lineup changes had an affair with Nick Flickwood's wife. All these things could have broken up the group. Oh, and also around uh, 1973, 1974, when Fleetwood Mac went off the road for a while just to recover from these problems, their manager of the time sent out a fake Fleetwood Mac with no actual Fleetwood Mac members to tour. So they had to have a big, complicated lawsuit with him. Wow. All along the way, all these unexpected things could have derailed the band. And the thing that got them suddenly from this kind of struggling, popular but not extremely popular band to become superstars was, again, Mick Fleetwood took advantage of a circumstance that a lot of people wouldn't have seen could really work to the advantage of the group. He was looking for studios in Los Angeles to record what would have been Fleetwood Mac's best next album at the end of 1974. They had moved to Los Angeles from England because they were starting to become more popular in the United States, and Bob Welch was from California, who was the um, main singer and guitarist at that time, besides the main songwriter besides uh, Christine McVie. He unexpectedly left the band. Now, while Mick Fleetwood was looking for studios, he went to Sound City near Los Angeles, and the guy who ran the studio, the producer Keith Olsen, played him a tape just to demonstrate the kind of sound they would get that you could get at the studio. So what was that tape? It was Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks working on what would have been their second album. Wow. And Keith Olsen wasn't, the producer, wasn't playing it to Mick Fleetwood to say, don't you like these guys? Wouldn't you like to work with them? It was just, this is the kind of good sound we can get in the studio. So when Bob Welch left, Mick Fleetwood remembered that tape. And he actually called Keith Olsen, the producer, and said, can you get me in contact with um, the guitarist, Lindsey Buckingham, because we need a new guitarist. And then when he met with Lindsey Buckingham, Buckingham said, if I join Fleetwood Mac, you've got to take Stevie too, because we're a musical duo. They were also romantically involved at that point. So to their credit, I mean, a lot of bands would have said, we're not taking your girlfriend, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, you know, they all five met together, and they thought, well, this could work. Let's do this. And... Mick Fleetwood wasn't like, well, they're going to take us away from the sound that we have, and that might be a problem. He saw that, well, this will actually put us in new directions. 
that are interesting, especially because instead of just having one good songwriter, Christine McVie, because Fleetwood and McVie didn't write, really, we're going to have three good songwriters, commercial songwriters, who have different styles, but they can blend. You hear that on their mid to late 1970s albums, even if it's you know, one or the other of the three writing a song, there will be interaction between their vocals, so they sound very much like a group. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty long explanation of where they, how they got to be superstars, but you have to hear the whole story to understand how it happened. So writing that part of the story was very interesting to me, and especially the Peter Green part, because he was really great, and he's still unknown, or I shouldn't say unknown, but he is not known nearly as much as he should be, especially in the United States. Right, and you know, I was watching um, an interview with Stevie Nicks recently for in preparation for this, and she said that it wasn't going well with her and Lindsay, you know, as far as a record deal for their second record. It was, it was, you know, kind of shady about what was going to happen. And her parents said, you know, give it six months. If something doesn't happen, you can come home. We'll pay for you to go to college, and, you know, that'll be the end of, of your music career. And two months after they gave her that deal, they got the call from Mick Fleetwood. So, you know, it was all the way around. It was like it was so meant to be, you know, that they be a band. Yeah, and I had said that Mick Fleetwood should get a lot of credit for recognizing the potential, the potential of Buckingham and Nick's. But also Buckingham and Nick should also get credit because they were trying to make it on their own. They already had one album out. It hardly did anything. But they realized plugging into this band, even if you know we're not going to be writing everything and we're not going to be having as much creative control, it gives us more pluses than um, we could possibly get working on our own because Fleetwood Mac not only already had a reputation, but they already have musical um, strengths. Christy McVie, of course, is a singer and songwriter, but the rhythm section that had established themselves over the course of more than five years. So they realized it's going to be more than the sum of the parts if we hook up as a quintet, which almost broke up during rumors. I mean, it, it didn't, all the um, kind of controversy and upset did not end when they got together and they didn't like, okay, now we're just making albums and it's happily ever after, things got kind of more combustible when the two romantic relationships broke up at exactly almost the same time and Nick Fleetwood then had an affair with Stevie Nicks. All these things could have broken up the group at the peak of their popularity. They realized, and I have heard this comment in some histories of other bands who had very stormy histories like The Who, they realized the band is more important than us as individuals. Right. Not only even musically, but in their personal lives. Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend had terrible fights, and they're still performing together. They're coming here in a few months. And Roger Daltrey had a comment. He got thrown out of the band very briefly in the mid-60s, like right around the time of my generation. Mm-hmm. And he said, I realized there was one thing in the world I loved more than myself, and that was the band. Right. I was going to go back and apologize to them, even if I thought I was right, just to keep the band going. And there was that same element of sacrifice in Fleetwood Mac. Yes. Yes. And and so through all your research that you did for them, was there anything that shocked you um, that you didn't know, like before, while you were doing the research? Well, I shouldn't say this is... Um, so much a shock as far as their history. But to go back to the earlier versions of the band, Jeremy Spencer, who was a very good slide guitarist, a very colorful guy on stage, he um, has a reputation of being a real weirdo for joining that group, Children of God. Something that was of great help when I was putting together their early history is this documentary about Peter Green called Man of the World which came out in England almost 10 years ago, but it finally did come out here last year. It's very good, but also suddenly Jeremy Spencer is right there on on screen being interviewed, like, you know, around 2007 or something, about 10 years ago, 
Mm-hmm. And he's really coherent, lucid, and funny. You would never suspect that, or you wouldn't match the guy you see there with the image you have of this guy who suddenly became brainwashed, which is sometimes the way that story is told. Oh. So, um, I mean, that was kind of a pleasant surprise. He's still affiliated with that group, by the way. But um, Peter Green had a very sad story where he never really recovered mentally. So did Danny Kerwin. But to see that Jeremy Spencer, whatever you might think of his religious beliefs, um, has a together life was interesting to me and um, and heartening. So that's not so much a surprise about the history of the group as it is um, something I wouldn't have suspected that I found out along the way. Right, right, because you've written so many books and, you know, like I said, it's kind of a lot of this stuff is documented, but what's so special about your book, first of all, is that the hard copy, I mean, the pictures are just beautiful. And, you know, the pictures that you have, I've seen, you know, a lot of them I've never seen before. It is so much fun to go through them and, and see them from the beginning to now that, you know, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this book over and over again. And that's why I highly suggest people buy this book, you know, in hard copy because it, it's absolutely beautifully done. And, uh, and, and, you know, Fleetwood Mac to me was, you know, I, like I said, when I was in high school, it was then Stevie Nicks, okay? But when I went back after reading Mick Fleetwood's autobiography, I went back and re-listened to rumors. And I think everybody should do that after reading your book. Because I think you really get a sense of what, you know, who was writing what song and what was going on at the time. And I think that's why it was the big hit that it was, was because there was so much feeling in that writing. And then you can see it. It's, it's like they, they just wrote it all down, you know? Yeah, and there's diversity. And if we're talking about rumors and also the album before that, that's just called mm-hmm. Sweet With Matt, um, Stevie Nicks very quickly got more attention than anyone else in the band because of her stage presence. But, and I'm sure she would agree with this, the other two songwriters were on par with what she was writing and singing. I -hmm. think that Christine McVie's material especially tends to get overlooked, although she did write some of the most popular songs like Over My Head. Right. Because she's On stage, anyway, she's just, you know, more retiring. She's kind of like off to the side. She's not dancing around. She's not even like Lindsey Buckingham, you know, kind of more mobile with the guitar. Right. But I think I think she was just as important musically to um, what they were doing. Um, And to go back to your question, did anything really surprise you when I was writing the book? To get to uh, refer to something that's more well-known to most Fleetwood Mac fans. If we're talking about the Rumors Sessions, Mm -hmm. they recorded quite, or they tried to record quite a bit of it in Sausalito, which is very close to where I live in San Francisco. It's just across the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. And going back over that again, it was striking how unproductive they were. They were recording what was going to be one of the most popular albums of all time, and they were up here for like two or three months, and they used hardly anything because not only because there were fights within the group at that time with these romantic conflicts, but because things that they were trying in the studio were not working out, and there were different ideas of what to do it, how to do it, and the equipment they, that they were trying out wasn't working. So that album, which um, is not as complicated as Tusk say, the process behind it was so complicated. All of these studios, um, all of this editing together, like a year, and this is 1977 when you can't edit stuff on computer or mm-hmm. mail stuff back and forth. So although you wouldn't suspect it from listening to the record, it sounds like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe they might have spent a couple months on this working hard on these um, dozen or so songs. It just took an enormous amount of time and enormous amount of struggle, even discounting that they almost broke up over their personal issues, just musically working it out was so complicated. Right. Yeah, that is kind of shocking because, you know, I I thought the same thing. 
it, it makes it seem like it was such an easy thing. Like, oh, we all wrote these songs. It's so easy. We'll just produce them, put them out. You know, it it always I, I think it always appears easier than what it was. But you know, it I can only I can't even you know I've heard all their interviews and now I've read a lot of their books and you still can't imagine what they were going through when they were doing it and the fact that they didn't realize you know they're putting together a, an album that's not going to get beat on the charts until Michael Jackson comes out with Thriller. So, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, Tusk sounds like a complicated album and um, you're only three years younger than me. So you probably remember the same news reports from the time where there are these reports in Rolling Stone and other places saying this is shaping up to be the most expensive record of all time. They're not even sure they're going to finish. It just keeps going on and on. But rumors does not sound that way. It sounds pretty straightforward. Right. So it's a surprise to find out that, um, yeah, it might not have been as expensive as Tusk, and of course Tusk was a double album, but the process was so involved. And by the way, I didn't put this in the book because it happened about uh, six months after the book came out, but I was able to go to the record plant studios in Sausalito where they did a lot of this recording. Wow. They're trying they're trying to, um, the record plan's been out of business for almost 10 years, but they're trying to revise it. And one of the guys involved with trying to revise it was one of the co-producers, Ken Kayad. And I got to um, interview him in the room where a lot of the sessions that they tried to do for Rumors was recorded in Sausalito. And he has this ambition, I'm not sure if it's possible, but he wants to have some days at least where the public can come in if the studio opens it, opens again, where they can kind of simulate the setup of the band when they were working on rumors and say, wow. you know, Nick was in that, yeah, Nick was in that corner, John was here, um, you know, Christine's keyboards were here, I did the mixing back here. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's an interesting uh, prospect because, you know, even some studios which are famous, and still going to today, like Abbey Road, it's very rare that they would invite the public in for anything, and probably never for something so expensive. Right, right. And, you know, I I think they're still touring. I think they still get together, if I'm not wrong. I mean, it hasn't been that long ago, anyway, that they've done a tour. So, you know, you I don't know. Oh, yeah, please with Mac. Yeah, yeah, and that's where the story ends, like, you know, their most recent world tour when they have the most famous quintet together again with Christine McVie, who have, was uh, afraid of flying for quite a few right. years. Right, right. But something that's, that's frustrating about the story, it's, it's not that frustrating to me, it's a little interesting, but I'm sure it frustrates fans, is that even though they reunited for these very successful tours, they keep talking about making new records, and it just never happens. And any time there's a news report saying, well, now Stevie Nicks says, I think, you know, next year we can do this, or Mick Fleetwood says, um, I'm pretty sure things are going to happen. At this point, it's like someone who cries wolf. You just don't really believe them. <laughs> and I don't know what the obstacle is. But, you know, over the course of 12 years, you should be able to get, her, get together 12 talks <laughs> with three writers, and maybe they're thinking – they're not really saying too much about what they're thinking. Maybe they're thinking, oh, it's not really good for the group. I want to do this myself, or it's not coming out the way I want to, or uh, it's not as good as we want it to be. But I'm not right. sure they're ever going to do another studio album because it's just been too long. I feel the same way. And and I always felt bad, and, and especially when I read this in your book about Tusk, because I do remember it. And it was interesting at the time when I when I was living it was that it was considered a failure and I looked at it as a failure but as I'm reading your book I'm like why did I think that why was I well because it didn't sell like rumors did we always had the perception that it was supposed to be better than but it wasn't it didn't sell better than but it was a double LP and and it didn't do bad you know it, it actually was a very successful album but it doesn't get you know unfortunately because of rumors those you know, the album that always follows seems like it's a disappointment, you know? Yeah, and there's some standards which are very hard to reach. Now, you go back to the Beatles in the 60s, 
it did seem like every album was at least as good as the last or better, and it was always different. Right. And rumors were so huge that I think there were expectations on the fans, but also the record label, that um, the next record is going to sell at least as much, maybe more, right. because it's almost unprecedented in the numbers of copies that it's selling and how even a year or two later it's still being played all over the radio. And when they didn't do something like that, I think that there was kind of a backlash, especially at the record label. Um, that was an interesting thing to read about, um, which I hadn't remembered very much from reading about it when I was 17 at the time. Warner Brothers, the people there were like already mentally calculating their Christmas bonuses because Tusk was going to come out. And oh, so they were figuring, there's a, you know, there's another 10 million that we're going to sell within a year. And it's a double album, um, which they didn't want, but they it's potentially more money coming in. So first of all, it doesn't sell as much, so Warner Brothers, their label, isn't as happy. But here's another example where Fleetwood Mac did something unexpected. They could have done a record pretty similar to Rumors or the Fleetwood Mac album, the White Album, as it's called. Mm -hmm. And even if it was not nearly as good, it would have just sold five or six million because it kind of sounded like Rumors. But they, and especially Lindsey Buckingham, were determined to do something not just different, but that they knew was not going to be as popular. I really think that. Mm. Especially Lindsey Buckingham stuff, recording with a marching band, doing some stuff that's a little new. Right, influence. right. They knew that some fans were going to be like, I don't have to buy this record, even though I listened to rumors, uh, you know, a hundred times. Maybe I don't have to buy this record and it's more expensive than a single. So they knew they were going to kind of take a hit or that they were risking at least taking a hit. But it was more important to them to get the record out that they wanted. Yeah, as artists, exactly. You know, which is, you know, why they're so amazing. But, you know, but I, I thought Stevie Nicks said something pretty interesting, too, um, when she was doing an interview about that time, about that era compared to now, that I really liked. And she said, you know, back then, you could, you would, you would do an album, you'd figure out what songs should go where, and say you put a song you're not sure is going to do well as like the third song. Well, people are going to listen to it because it's between the second and the fourth song that they really like. And, you know, she said, but in today's technology, you can't really plan it like that because people are getting their music as the songs are coming out. They're skipping other songs. And, and she said, you know, I, as an artist, I'm really happy that I was doing those albums back in the day when they were albums instead of downloading, just downloading singles, you know. And I was like, right, because they really did think about where those songs were going to be, you know. I think, I think that is a good point. Well, here's something else that's interesting that was reinforced by my research. For Rumors, they actually had more songs than they used on the record. And um, with one of Stevie Nicks' extra songs, even though Nick Fleetwood acknowledged this is a good song, he also realized there's no easy way to fit this into the flow of what's going to make the best record. So, you know, Silver Springs comes out on something else, and another song else had to be edited down because back in those days, the right. final sound That's quality was thing. compromised. Yeah. You had more than 22 minutes aside. Yeah. And, you know, she was upset at, she was upset at the time, but it's, from the comment that you just relayed, it sounds like she's realizing there's an art to putting together the best album, the best beginning-to-end experience. And that's kind of getting lost, at least among some people who are habitually just zeroing in on certain songs. And this isn't, you know, what you're asking me about in this interview, but I'm wondering if the new Sgt. Pepper reissue gets people thinking about, again, it is, it can be really important to sequence songs in a specific order and edit, you know, the 15, 20 songs you have to the ones that make the most sense to be grouped together, because part of Sgt. Pepper's durability is that you can't imagine the sequence going any other way, or you can't imagine George plugging in his extra song, only a northern song, which wasn't that great actually, into this album without weakening it. And this reissue is getting so much attention that maybe some people, you know, whatever their age, whether they're veterans or they just become stars, thinking. I shouldn't only be thinking about what are good songs that people are going to want to click on 
they do that a lot these days to listen to songs, but also mm-hmm. what make mm-hmm. a, what ma- might make a good group of songs, even if it's not a following the same theme with the songs, but just songs that create a mood that um, belong together. With rumors, there's no story or theme, but part of the recurring mood, I think, is these songs about um, staying together in the face of these obstacles, whether it's a group or a couple, Mm -hmm. or even if you're breaking up, like go your own way, you do it with strength and dignity. Um, You know, I'm sure in real life they were screaming at each other a lot, but for the song, the strength and dignity. And that's more important. You know, I don't know these people personally, but, you you know, millions of people can take that from the song. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, when I heard her say that, I was like, you know, because we know when you put an album on, okay, you know, yeah, I remember moving the needle, but you really didn't, A, you didn't want to scratch the album, you know, you were always <laughs> risking that happening, and, you know, in my world, you know, that wasn't going to, I wasn't just able to just go buy albums all the time, and B, you just let it play, you know, and then you did like every song on the, you know, some sides better than the others, but you basically knew your whole album because, you know, you would save up and buy that album. But, you know, and it wasn't about buying a song on iTunes that you happen to like. You know, it's, it was a lot, it was a very different world. So, and and Sgt. Pepper's was the first album that I remember, that I remember listening to. So I'm really happy about that, you know, about their new release. So that'll be fun. Yeah. But anyway, so, okay, you've written all of these books. And when I went back to look at them, I was like, oh, my God, like, you're writing all, I mean, The Who, The Beatles, and, and now Fleetwood Mac, and, and tons of them in between about the 60s. And so what is, what is on, you know, what's on tap? What, what, do you, what do you really want to do next? Or have you already done it? Have you already, do you already have the next one done that you're going to release? Yeah, for the same company in the same format, I wrote a book on Bob Marley and the Whalers, uh, and that's coming out in September. You know, it's hard to, the way books work, you know, I finished the manuscript back in August, so it's been a while for me, but it comes out, you know, there's a lot of uh, production process, especially with books like these with a lot of photos. So um, every, the whole production process is done, but it actually is not available until September 1st. But it's the same kind of thing. There's a similarity with the Fleetwood Mac book. Bob Marley is one of the most popular musicians in the world now, but the basis of his popularity is what he did for the last seven or so years of his life when he became widely known outside of Jamaica. But he had a career with the other whalers, too. Before that, in Jamaica primarily, for ten years, and it's very interesting. So kind of like the Peter Green section of my book, the early section of my book, I think, it's interesting to me as a writer, but I think it's also interesting to readers who understandably won't know much about this, usually, this period of Marley's life, because his music was not getting played hardly at all outside of Jamaica. Anyway, that's the next book. And Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and I love that you make them collector's editions. I mean, I like I said, you know, these not everybody – does hardback like this anymore and so i was just thrilled that you did it and i'm sure it was a lot to put together to get these pictures and just everything you know their their reviews their album reviews like you know everything that's in this book is just amazing and um i'm really happy that you're you know you're still making book that that books are still getting made that are like this you know as a book lover yeah because i read some ebooks too and the pictures and the quality of paper is something that can't be reproduced if you want to right. see the visual. But, you know, especially with acts like Fleetwood Mac or Bob Marley, for that matter, who changed quite a bit over time. And um, some of the books that I've done, um, they don't they have hardly any pictures. And, you know, that, every book that a publisher um, commissions is going to be different. That's okay. But this is the most bountifully illustrated one that I've done. So yeah. that was interesting to me as well. Yeah, I just love it. I, I, I think it's, you know, 
I think they all should be like this. So, you know, that's just my, that's just my opinion. And I love hard facts anyway, but when you get the pictures done as beautifully as this, you can, you can really appreciate it and the quality of the paper, you know, you can really appreciate the, the book itself. So, well, thank you so much for talking to me. I mean, I, I love this. I can't say enough about it. If you're a Fleetwood Mac fan, you will love this book. No matter how much you know about them, there's still always other things to know, even looking at the pictures, there's, you know, there's, there's many reasons why you should have this book and, and hold on to it forever. So thank you so much, Richie. Um, thank you for having me on, Michelle. Yes, and I can't wait for Bob Marley. That'll be so much fun. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and um, I'm sure um, you can you know, send me the links of whatever you want me to see, but I appreciate that. Yes, I definitely will. We'll talk to you soon, Richie. Thanks. Yep, bye-bye. Bye.